grab your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalms, the 89th chapter. Psalms 89, we're going to go through uh, a bunch of scripture this morning. So I'm going to set the stage for you, and then we're going to talk a little bit uh, about these scriptures. Psalms, the 89th chapter. And when you've got that, I want you to stand. We're going to make a confession to the Lord together. And grab your Bibles or your phones or whatever you have your Bible on and and let's stand and make this confession to the Lord together. It'll be up here on the screen. Are you ready? Here we go. Today I will open the word of God. May it be a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. May I hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now, Lord, I will open my heart to receive from you. I will open my ears to hear from you. I will open my eyes to see the needs of others. And I will open my mouth to tell of your goodness. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you guys. You may be seated, reseated, reseated like some of our hairlines this morning. What kind of church do you guys want to be a part of? I just want to ask you that question. What kind of church do you want to be a part of? I think it's interesting that when we do surveys within congregations, the pastor's opinion of where he wants the church to go is sometimes different from where the church wants to be going. Many pastors see the church as a mission for those who need Christ. Many church members see the church as a place to help other Christians. So sometimes there's a conflict between who we are and what we want in mission in our church. And I've just determined instead of trying my hardest to through, you know, osmosis or whatever, direct people and mental telepathy to get you guys to do certain things. Let's just come right out and say what we want as a church. One of the things that I want to be as a church is a place where people can come and experience the presence of God. I want that as a church. I want a church that whenever I have a need, I can come down to the front and I can pray and God can meet the need of my life. I want to have a place that it's safe to not be perfect. I want a church that when people come in, it doesn't matter what walk of life they come in, they can be millionaires, they can be homeless, it doesn't matter. They're gonna receive grace when they come in and they're gonna receive grace in the auditorium. I want a church like that. I want a church that we're quick to pray and slow to judge. And I don't think that this is a utopia that never can be achieved. I think that we can achieve it, but it's going to take us knowing that that's what we want in us going in a specific, certain direction of what's happening in church. I know growing up in church, I know my defense was a lot of times, well, why? You know, nobody's there. None of my friends are there. Or I don't know what to do at church. I I don't come with any need, you know. I was talking to Dave Weiniger about this earlier. Uh, We were talking on Wednesday night. He grew up in a pastor's home, and his dad used to tell him, listen, either you come down to get prayed for or you come down to pray for somebody, but you come down that aisle and we're going to pray this morning. And that's the way I feel sometimes. Don't look now, but if you come with all of your needs met and everything going good, don't look now. But listen, you need to respond sometimes just so other people can have that same confidence that they can come. And sometimes I just need to respond and respond to God and say, God, here I am. My life, I think things are going pretty well right now, but I need your covering for me. And I want to be someone who is quick to respond and slow to sit back and do nothing. And so with that concept in mind and with that understanding in mind, I want to be intentional about how we are as a church, especially as a family. I want to be intentional about how we are. Um, I saw a statistic from George Barn, and I apologize for not putting it up on the screen, but um, I saw a statistic from George Barna from one of his research groups or one of his uh, surveys that he did that, that showed this. In America today, 48% of the Christian population attend a church of under 100 people, 48%, while only 8% attend a church of over 1,000. Now, that's, that's alarming to me. Not alarming, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it, but that's shocking to me. 
10 years ago, the, the, the statistics were different. There were more who were attending the mega church and less who were attending the smaller church. And what we're seeing is trends coming where people, I, I was talking to someone the other day that said, I went to, we went to a large church here in town for years and we finally realized we don't know anybody here. We want to come to a church where we can be known. And I love that aspect of it because that's one of the benefits of a, of a small church. But when you guys come to this place, hopefully you feel loved and accepted and you feel like people know who you are. And we try hard to, to try to make that happen. I know there's some here that I haven't got to meet yet, but I look forward to meeting you after service. But here's the thing. People want family. People want connection. People want community. And one of the strongest things that we can do as a Christian body, as a Christian church, as a Christian organization, one of the strongest things we can do is develop strong relationships, especially strong family relationships, strong family relationships. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk specifically about family. What, what does it mean to be family, and how can we make our family stronger? And so this morning, that's kind of what I want to talk about. I want to, at the end of this message, I, I want to give you four steps to, to bring blessing to the next generation of your life. I want to give you four steps to bring blessing to the next generation of your life. And I hope by the end of this message, you, you catch this. I love this portion of scripture in Psalms, the 89th chapter. And let me jump in here and, and read this scripture to you because I think it's very important. Here, here, here's what it says. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness. I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your lips stand firm forever and you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The, the New King James Version says this in, in verse number two. It says, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Mercy shall be built up forever. In other words, what he's saying here is God saying, listen, mercy, the mercy that I have, it can be built up in your life and it can be passed on to the next generation. That's good news, I think. My faithfulness in my life can affect the generation that comes after me, how they will live their life. If I will live my life according to the promises of God and the precepts of God, that will drain over and will spill over to the people who are around me. If we keep going in verse number 30, it says this, of his, and this is talking about David's household or David's sons, of his sons, David's sons, forsake, um, if his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sins with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Basically, what, what the Lord is saying here is that, listen, if they disobey me, if, if, if David's sons, us, the descendants of David, if they disobey me, I will punish them. But I will not take away the promises that I have, that I gave to David, and that, that fall down to our generation. I will bless the generations that follow because of the faithfulness of a father and because of the faithfulness of the family. And I think for that is good news. David has always been one in the Bible that we see always had a faithful life. He was not perfect by any means. As a matter of fact, if you'll study David, you'll see that there are a lot of things in David's life that, that weren't right and that he failed and he had an affair and he went through a lot of things. He was a horrible father. We see these kind of things. But because he was faithful to the call of God in his life, God uses him throughout history to give favor to his people because of David's life. When we serve God, when we keep his commands, God says, I will bless the generations that follow. I will bless the ones that come after you. His mercies can be stored up. His blessings can be stored up for those who are coming behind us and those kids and those people who were around. When Solomon, David's son, went to build the temple, the Bible said that Solomon's father, David, had laid 1 million talents of silver and 100,000 talents of gold. 
In today's market, that would be like $85 billion. It was an enormous amount of money. But he left it for the resources of his son to be able to build a temple that would honor God because God would not let David build the temple, but he says, your son will build the temple. So David knew that the generations coming after him would need that blessing, would need that finances. So he worked hard to store up that blessing, to store up those things so that he could be able to bless the generation that came after them. Let me tell you something. We can, either be a bless, we can either be a blessing or a stumbling block to those people who come after us for our kids. We can either be a blessing for them. Our name and our family name and who we are can either bless them. They can hang their head high when they walk into a room and say, hey, aren't you so-and-so's child? Isn't your dad? Isn't your mom so-and-so? We can hang our head high or because of our actions, we can bow our head and try to duck out because of who we are and what we've done in our life. And I wanna encourage you this morning. Let me tell you, don't be a stumbling block for the people who are around you. Don't be a stumbling block for your kids, but be willing to stand up tall. I, I, I heard a pastor say, a few years ago at a wedding that I was attending. And he gave a charge to the bride and he was talking to her and he says, you know what, I knew your parents. And he says, you never have to bow your head down and duck your head down when you talk about your parents. You can always lift your head up high because we know who your parents are and you can be proud of who they are. Don't you wish that all of us could say that? Don't you wish that all of us could say, I'm proud of who my parents are and I'm proud of what they've accomplished and I'm proud of of, of, of the choices they've made. I, I wish that everyone could say that, but the, the fact is, is that we can't. Some of us have had dreadful home life and dreadful family situations. I counsel people all the time who have gone through horrible situations in their life, but here's the good thing. You can make a change this morning. You can start over. If you're married this morning, young marriage, we have several young married couples here, you can do it different from here on out. You don't have to follow the patterns of your parents. You can make a change in your life and you can do it differently. If you're not married, if you're single and you're here and you're, you're ready to mingle, all right? You're, you got, you're, you're ready to go. Let me tell you, the person that you choose to spend the rest of your life with is the second most important decision you will ever make. Make that choice wisely and then make the choice that we too are gonna follow God and we're gonna do the things that we know we ought to do. And if you will do that, you'll bring blessing to your family instead of curses to your family. Two things I wanna tell you this morning before I get into the four things that I wanna tell you, okay? Number one is this, sin can also be stored up. Sin can also be stored up. Exodus, the 20th chapter, the fifth verse, here's Moses giving kind of a, a reminder to all the children of Israel before they cross into the promised land. He's going back through and chronicling the whole story for them. And in chapter number 20, verse number five, he says this, if you bow down to idols, I'll punish your children to the third and fourth generation. Now, this may scare some of you guys this morning, and that's okay if it does. I'm just gonna preach the word and we'll try to explain it and, and wor worry about it afterwards. But this section may scare some of you. It does me just a little bit. But what scripture is saying here is it's saying that your children will be punished for your sins to the third and fourth generation. Now, it doesn't give any specifics on this. Okay, is that forgiven sin, unforgiven sin? Of course, back then, uh, you know, they had to, to, to sacrifice um, animals and things like that to, to get forgiveness of their sins. So it was a little bit different back then. But just the premise, just the understanding that my kids will pay for my sins, that seems really unfair for my kids to pay for my sins. But here's the thing. When you sin in your life and when you violate the laws of God, you might think that it doesn't affect anybody else around you. Can I tell you? It affects everybody else around you. I would venture to say that probably your family is more aware of what your issues are than what you think they are. Thank you for those amens. I appreciate that. But I want you to understand this. The things that I do in my life and that I choose in my life, the failures I have, yes, they affect my children. Yes, they affect my family. And it may not be a curse that God puts on them, but it's something that they will live with because they've learned how to deal with things from seeing my life. They've learned how to deal with, 
with their, with their spouses by seeing the way that me and my wife respond to each other. They learn how to deal with pressure by seeing how we deal with pressure. They learn how to deal with temptation by seeing how we deal with temptation. So when I live my life completely shut off from everyone else, living in seclusion from everything that's around me, what I do is I hurt myself and I hurt my family who is so desperately looking for the real thing that they can follow along and be there and process that thing with me. So it's important for us to understand that yes, what we do affects the people who are coming behind us, not even to them, but it affects their kids and their kids to the fourth generation, that process. Is it nature or is it nurture? I don't know. I think it's probably a little bit of both, but it affects the people who come behind us. And so it's important that we understand this. Jeremiah thirty-two eighteen says this, you show love to thousands, but bring the punishment of the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Same premise. He's saying that what we do affects the people who are around us, and we see it in the New Testament too. Second Corinthians twelve fourteen says, after all, children should not have to save up for their, save up for their parents, but parents for their children. And it's not just talking about finances here, but it's also letting us know that what we save up, what we invest in, whether it's time or finances or energy, but what we invest in affects the kids that come behind us. Scripture tells us that a good man shall leave a good inheritance for his kids. And not just talking about money, talking about faith, talking about values, talking about godly living, because your kids will see everything that you do. You're laying up for yourselves riches, but also you're laying up for yourselves virtues. You're laying something up. Make sure you're laying the right things up for the right people. When we go back to this scripture that it talks about in Psalms, the 89th chapter, it said there, I will punish their sins with a rod. Whose sins? The sons of David, the children of David, the descendants of David. In other words, God treats us and holds us on a shorter leash than he does other people. When you have a relationship with God, when you're leaving a legacy, my kids will be judged at a different level than other people are judged. Hey, I dealt with it growing up. My dad was a pastor. Um, most all of his life, my grandfather was a pastor. I know that. I know what that's like. I never enjoyed sin. Well, maybe some, but most of it I never enjoyed. <laughs> Okay, no, I'm not gonna get into that, but most of it I never enjoyed because I knew that when I came home at the end of the night, I had a mom and dad there that were gonna look at me and they could tell everything I did. They knew it. They knew what I did. I went out one time with some of my friends and I can't believe I'm confessing this, but I'll confess just a little bit of it and won't go all the way. But I went out with some of my friends just before we went to college and we decided we were gonna go be destructive. And so we were tearing down basketball rims from houses. We, we were pretty tall guys and we would go up like we were slam dunking and we actually went to one house and went up in the whole rim, everything came down and we thought, hey, this is cool, let's do this some more, you know, this is fun. So we're out driving the neighborhood, you know, tearing down basketball rims. I have no idea what came over us. It was a, it was a you know, just a moment of ignorance in our lives and so we came to one house and we did it and the, the homeowner happened to be outside and saw it happen and we took off and he took off after us and so that was it for us. We were done and I took all my friends home. When I got home, my dad says, where have you been and what have you been doing? What? Well, I didn't think of it, but my dad was a chaplain on the police department in Broken Arrow and he had a scanner that he listened to in case they needed him and it came over the scanner, Kelly Goins, and it gave the car and it gave everything and what he did. So my dad knew before I got home what had happened. And so the wrath of mom and dad came down upon my body and upon me. You never know. You never know. God will figure out a way. I never enjoyed it. I couldn't be comfortable doing sin because I knew that my mom and dad would find out about it, and I knew at the end of the day God would find out about it. So I had to be careful. I couldn't enjoy it because God keeps us at a different level than he keeps everybody else now. I, I'm, I can't do, I'm, I'm gonna chase rabbits all night, if I, I mean, all morning if I keep going. How many of you have seen those electric fences that they'll put in yards for dogs? Have you seen those? 
they bury a, a cord in the ground and then they put this collar on the dog and if the dog gets close to it, it'll shock them. Well, they say it works with most dogs, but there are some dogs just like, this ain't gonna work with me. I mean, they'll go through and they'll get shocked and they'll stop and look at it for a while and they'll hit it again. And then finally, they'll just bolt. Boom, they'll just go right on through it. And once they get on the other side of it, they're scot-free. It doesn't matter. Boom, it just doesn't matter. We are like that with Christian. We are like that with sin. We can come to sin and we feel that conviction from the Holy Spirit that says, don't do that. But if we'll keep hitting it and keep hitting it and keep hitting it, and finally, if we'll push through that, Eventually, that conviction will go away to some degree, that now we'll start believing it's okay for me to do this because I'm not getting shocked. I don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore, so God must not care. No, 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 God cares, but you have just gone so far out of bounds that you don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore. Get back close to mom and dad. Get back close to God, and you'll begin to feel that conviction that God has for you. In us and our lives, we need to be held on a short leash that when we feel that conviction from the Holy Spirit, it pulls us back and we stop what we're doing because we know that's an area that's dangerous for our lives and that can hurt us and we need to be careful of that. So we can store up these kind of things and, and let me just keep going. We can store up these kind of things. Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you've ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. You see, what we do makes a difference. The relationship that we have with God affects the people in our lives. Your sin can be stored up and your children can reap the detriments of that sin. Well, here's my second point, and this one hopefully will make you feel a little bit better. Uh, blessing can also be stored up. Blessing can also be stored up. And this is exciting. I love this. Psalms 103, 17 says, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him in his righteousness to the children's children. Luke 1, 50 says this, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. 2 Timothy 1, 5, I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So that blessing can be passed on. Blessing can be passed on from generation to generation. That's what the New Testament lets us know. The New Testament is evidence of this. When we go back to the Old Testament, we also see this, especially in the life of David. David's influence was so great on the next generations that for years, even after his death, God would bless his family members according to his faithfulness to David and according to his love for David. And even his family members would invoke the name of David to try to get God's blessing on their life. I want you to see this, watch this. David has been dead for 11 years. Solomon has built the temple. It's dedication day. There are 10,000 men who have worked 11 years cutting lumber. 150,000 men have worked seven and a half years to build the temple. Three million are attending the dedication service. 4,000 ushers, amen. Wouldn't that be awesome to have 4,000 ushers? 4,000 in the choir, Mark. Wouldn't that, that that'd, be a, that'd be a lot. 4,000 in the orchestra, amen for that. Solomon offers 20,000 oxen in a sacrifice and 120,000 sheep in a sacrifice to the Lord. Then Solomon prays this prayer to ask for God's blessing in 2 Chronicles 6.42. And he says this, remember the mercies of your servant, David. The grandson is actually saying, I'm sorry, the son is actually saying, remember the mercies that you had for David. Remember the faithfulness that you had for David, oh God. Now with that same faithfulness, would you bless us? And Scripture says that it tugged on the heart of God. In the Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, it says, when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down from heaven and, and consumed the altar, and the glory of the Lord was on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground and on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, listen to this, and his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Because of the faithfulness of one man, we see the mercies of God that are extending to his children. Let me keep going. David had been dead for 23 years. Solomon had now gone wild. 
He, he was out of control. He had a thousand wives. Just stop and think about that for a second. A thousand. A thousand. I can't afford one. But she's worth every penny of it. Isn't it great? First Kings eleven eleven. So the Lord said this to Solomon. Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my commands and my decrees, which I commanded to you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to another of your subordinates, one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, listen to this. For the sake of David, your father, I will not do this during your lifetime. So he says to him, listen, because of your unfaithfulness, because of your wickedness, because of all the things that you're doing in your life, I'm gonna take this kingdom away from your family and I'm gonna give it to another. But I won't do it because of the faithfulness that I have to your father. I won't do it within your lifetime. It's the mercies and the grace of God that is seen in his father's life because of the faithfulness of his father. It's coming down to the children and to the children's children. God doesn't spare you because you're good, but because someone has been praying for you can I tell you, you are riding on the shoulders of somebody that's been praying for you for generations. You're riding on the shoulders of somebody who's made that connection to God. You may be in the first in your family who's come to God, but can I tell you, somewhere along the way, there's been a grandparent or a grandma, aunt, uncle, somebody that's been praying for you, and we're riding on their shoulders to get where we're going. Let me keep going. David's now been dead for 57 years. This is Solomon's grandson, Abijah. He's now king of Judah. And 1 Kings says this, 1 Kings 15, verse number four, or verse number, we're starting at verse number three, says this. He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his forefather had been. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and by making Jerusalem strong. God did not give up on him and God did not want the lamp of God to be extinguished in Jerusalem. So if the father's not gonna do it, God skipped him and came to the son and rose up a son who was gonna keep the commands because of his faithfulness to his great-grandfather David. Man, may it be said of you, that your great-grandchildren, the Lord blesses them because of your faithfulness, amen? My grandpa pastored most all of his life. He committed his life to the ministry when he was in his early 20s. I've told you guys that story. But he pastored all of his life. He was bivocational, what we would call bivocational. He was, a, he was an electrical contractor, and plus he pastored a church, and he did that most all of his life. But let, let me tell you something. Because of the faithfulness of my grandfather, because of his hard work, because of his dedication to God, my father decided that he would pick up that and felt the call of God on his life, and he became a pastor. My father pastored for many years, has pastored some of the great churches here in Oklahoma. And because of the faithfulness of my father, I decided to go that way and be a pastor also. But I understand that I'm riding on the shoulders of a of, of a, 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 my grandfather who pastored until he was 100 years old, he kept pastoring his church because of the faithfulness that he had stored up, because of what he wanted to do, because he knew that he could affect people's lives. And I'm riding on that this morning. I'm riding on the generation of people who have come before us. We're able to have this building in this church because of men and women who have come before us who have helped pay these buildings off and keep this ministry going. We're riding on the shoulders of those people's faithfulness, and it's up to us to keep that flame here in Tulsa and to keep it going. Amen? Let me give you one more. David's been dead for 305 years. Hezekiah now is David's, listen to this, great, 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 great grandson. And he's the king. The king of Assyria had sent a letter to Hezekiah and said that he was gonna come down and attack them and destroy them. Hezekiah took that letter and he put it on the altar of the Lord and began to cry out to God and ask God to intervene. And God did. God showed up and fought the battle for him. And at that battle, he slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one day because of the power of God that came down and defended them. 
when he asked God, why did he spare the, the, king, the kingdom of Israel? Here's what God says in 2 Kings 19, 32. For my sake, for, for God's reputation, for his sake, and for the sake of David, my servant. Basically, he's saying, listen, it's 305 years ago, but I still remember that man. I still remember the promise I made to him, and that promise is still good for this generation, and it keeps going. And God fulfilled that promise by sending a descendant of David onto this earth and allowed him to die on the cross and allowed him to pay for the sins of the world so that that blessing that he put on David could be expanded to the whole generation. And now we as Christians can come into this new covenant that was given to David, that was represented through Jesus Christ's death, and now we have in our lives. So the same blessing that was on David's life can now be on us and for the generations to come. That's the faithfulness of God. That's the faithfulness of God to your generation. Five, three says this, give ear and come to me, Listen what, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. God's covenant is still for us today. But here's the fact. You have to decide how are you gonna live your life? Let me ask you this. Are you living your life so that the generations that are coming behind you will be blessed? Or are you living your life thinking that you can fool everybody around you and all the things that are going on. Or maybe God's not impressed. Or maybe that God doesn't care about your sin. Maybe you're flying under the radar and you think that God really doesn't care. Or maybe you've rationalized that the Bible is just a fictional book and the things that the Bible says are not really important. Okay, throw the Bible out then. Most of the sins that God commands us not to commit are things that we need to not do to keep ourselves and our families safe. It's just moral laws, and if you'll stop and think about it, it's the way society is supposed to run. But he gave us that in a book to, to, to live by. You can read that book and live by it, or you can live by the, the norms of society, which fluctuate and change. But I'm going to live by the word of God because God is the one who created humankind and knows how to make humankind function. So I want to live by the way that he says. And for my life, following what God says is the best place for me to be because it ensures that my family will have the blessing of God. Is my family perfect? They're not, other than my wife. The rest of them are just not perfect. But see, that's where they follow me, maybe. But here's one thing I know, that is if I follow God, and if I keep his statutes, and if my children will do the same thing, what we will see is we will see a generation that loves God and continues to serve him. So here's my four things. Are you ready? All that. That's what, that was the intro, all right? <clears throat> four things. <clears throat> Number one is this. Four things that you can pass down, four keys that you can pass down to the next generation. One of this. Number one is this. Come out of the shadows. Come out of the shadows. It's easier to reject everyone else than feel rejected myself. I'm gonna say to you, especially men, come out of the shadows of your life. Men, we can live under the radar as long as I got my wife fooled. My kids aren't around me enough. They don't really know what's going on. But as long as I got my wife fooled, everything's okay. I want you to know something. That's just not the truth. Because the things that you do on a daily basis affect everybody who's around you. So come out of the shadows. Quit living in isolation. Quit thinking that if I can fool my wife that everybody else is gonna be fooled. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The enemy will so corrupt and so turn your heart away from your relationship with your wife and your family, one day you will leave it all behind to try to fulfill your destiny, your pleasure, your fun. And one day you're gonna end up lonely and afraid and alone when you hit rock bottom and think if I only would have known that earlier. I'm telling you right now, this isn't a fallacy. I've seen it live out. I've seen it live out. I could give you names and addresses of people who have believed the lie from the enemy and now they have no family. Everybody is gone from them. They hit rock bottom and there's no way to come back. Yes, there is, because I want you to know something. God's grace is bigger than your sin. Your sin doesn't trump God's grace. He can forgive you and cleanse you and make you whole again. Number one is that. Number two is this, drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. We don't need 
President Trump here to help us drain the swamp. We can do it right here in our own lives. Get rid of any moral filth in your life. Get rid of the things that you're holding on to that you don't want anybody else to know about. Get rid of the, the stash that you have hidden somewhere. Get rid of the things that you don't want anybody else to know on your computer, your phone. You hide them from everybody else. Get rid of the conversations. Get rid of the relationships that no one knows about. Get rid of those things. Get rid of them. Throw them away. Destroy them. Get rid of them. Because as long as you had those things in your life and in your house, the Lord cannot bless you. And you put the enemy in a position in your life to be able to captivate you and destroy your marriage and destroy your family. He'll do it every time because that's what he does. He doesn't come in and create new situations. He just takes what God does and tries to corrupt it. So he tries to corrupt sex. He tries to corrupt money. He tries to corrupt our relationships. He tries to corrupt our appetites and desires that should be fulfilled in other ways. But he wants to stimulate those with alcohol and stimulants and chemicals to try to get us to the place that he wants us to be. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he's capable of doing. And if the devil's involved in it or if you sense that, get rid of it because it is going to kill your life. Come out of the shadows. Make sure that you drain the swamp. Number three, seek out accountability. You're going to have to find people that you can be accountable to. You're going to have to find a brother or sister that you can confide in, that you can say, listen, there's some things in my life that I need to let you know about. And then if someone comes to you like that, hold it at the highest level of confidence that you possibly can. Obviously, if it's a danger to children, you're going to have to report that and take that into consideration. But moral things, you have, to high, you have to hold that at the highest accountability that you possibly can, the secrecy that you possibly can, and work on those ways to get those things come out. But there is a release that happens when we can be accountable for it. And the last one is start doing the right thing. If you want to pass on to the next generation something that's blessing and not curse, that's blessing and not sin, then start doing the right thing right now. Make that choice. I'm going to start doing it right now from this point on, and God's going to change my life. Do you believe that he can do that? Do you believe that he can do it? I know he can do it. I've seen him do it over and over again. My God is faithful to meet the needs in your life. I want you to stand with me, would you please? Lord Jesus.